Welcome back to another episode of the Logo Fit Show, where we redefine what healthy means to you. I'm your host, Lauren Conlon, and this week I'm joined by Rick, our team mental health counselor, and we are actually going to go over a, a question that was sent in, and I think this is such a such an important topic, and I really, really appreciate whoever sent this in, and hopefully it can give some clarity here, and then also just you know, for anybody else listening, because this is inevitable for any of us in our life. Hi, I've listened to your podcast for a while and wanted to write in because I'm struggling with the death of a close friend. I've had family members pass away before, but I'm really struggling with his death and loss for my life. I would like to know how you, Lauren and Rick, deal with death. Are there any rituals or ceremonies beyond the traditional wake and funeral that have helped you deal with or get over the loss of losing someone important to you? Thank you for considering my request. This is like so tough and I, I've had family members pass and people that I know, but I have not had a close friend pass at at this stage in my life, which very grateful, but I'm definitely anticipating that being really hard because, you know, close friendships are so, so intimate. So I guess, do you want to go first from a, I guess, a, a clinical perspective, potentially, like what are some ways to deal with you know, loss and, and, and grief or deal with loss and, and, and just navigate grief. Cause there's all the different stages. Right? There's mm-hmm. five stages mm-hmm. of grief, right? Yeah. Do you want to go through that first? Maybe sure. I, I know it's pretty standard, but could be useful. Yeah. No. Um, first I, I don't know who wrote the question in, but it's clear that this one person was special to them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the one thing with death is if in anybody in your life, if you've ever lost anybody, it's very easy to relate to that pain. Um, so it's not difficult to be empathetic toward this particular person. You know, my heart breaks for them and their loss because when you have somebody who's such a significant person in your life, whether it's a support, it's a friend, it's a whoever, your life just doesn't feel the same without them. And so really what you're struggling with is learning to live your life without this person and it's like rediscovering parts of you and so there's a lot of different emotions that people can feel i think what you're alluding to is what's known as like the kubler ross five stages of grief and loss Um, oftentimes the first stage is denial Um, and then the various stages that come after that can go in various order but usually it's denial followed by sadness um, followed by anger and then there's usually bargaining or negotiation And then the final phase is acceptance. Um, So what does denial look like? Denial oftentimes, I don't think this person's in denial because they're, they're writing into a show to talk about what they're feeling. So denial is oftentimes it presents as just somebody's unwillingness to grasp that the person's actually gone, like almost living their life as if nothing has really changed, like not processing through their emotions, maybe not even getting highly emotional. There's just like this, a natural defense that people will feel um, it's kind of like, Hey, why is this person still like, you know, walking around and cleaning and talking to everybody? Like everything is okay. You know? And so sometimes denial is a difficult space for people to really accept, not accept because acceptance is the final phase, but just to, to break through it's their mind's way of protecting them against the pain that they're feeling. Um, and so usually denial, if the person's in denial, they're not going to experience any of the other phases until they get out of denial. And then once you're out of denial, the other three phases, because you have denial on one end and acceptance on the other. Acceptance is like, I know that they're gone and I'm moving on in my life and I've, I've learned that. So those are the ends. The middle is where anger, depression, and bargaining take place. And you can watch somebody in like one conversation rotate through all three. Um, it's sometimes it's common for somebody to be stuck in one phase and then move into the next phase. Um, or you can experience them multiple phases at the same time. Depression. I think we're all pretty familiar with what depression looks like, you know, overwhelming feelings of sadness, you know, um, excessive sleeping or no sleeping, um, withdrawing from family and friends and other people, other relationships. Um, you know, they stop doing things that used to bring them joy and pleasure and they're just very alone. They're crying a lot. They're quiet. They're removed. Um, Anger, depending on the person who died and the circumstances surrounding the death, um, anger can be pointed in a lot of different directions. Anger can be pointed at God for taking this person. Anger could be pointed at 
the individual or individuals or group or organization that might be responsible for the person's death, like if it was a drunk driver or if it was something that occurred overseas in like a war. Um, there's a lot of anger to go on. Anger at yourself for not having a better relationship. Um, oftentimes what we find is, and I'm by no way, shape, or form, because the, the question's doesn't really provide a ton of detail. So we don't know the context, like why this person is struggling. I've seen people struggle with death because the person was so important to them and they were so loved. And maybe this was like the one individual in their life that really felt like I matter to them. And so if they're gone, like that's hard. I've also seen people have a hard time with death when the relationship wasn't in good terms and the person passed away. Right. And so there's this unfinished business, so to speak. And so now you're left with whatever guilt or shame or disappointment you have toward yourself or the things that you said or things that you did. Um, and if anybody has, if you can reflect back on your own life to something that you almost hate yourself for doing, you can empathize with that person. Um, and then the bargaining negotiation phase is very much like, well, if I had done this, this would have been different. If I hadn't gone to Mikey's house that night, or if I had just driven home a different way, or if you, you know what I mean? And so you see this, like this, like what would have been different? Like, you know, like there's a thousand what ifs and you can't predict the future. And so really what you see is just people struggling to grasp the death and it occurs. Um, all the time. This is a normal process. You cannot, there's no rules or guidelines to this. One person can experience this for several weeks. Another person could experience this for several years. You know, they can stay stuck in a depressive state for the rest of their life, depending on who it is. Some of the worst deaths that are out there are suicides and suicides of children. If there's early in my career, I worked, I got started, um, as a grief and loss counselor, one of my friends from school, she had a church organization and they used to do grief and loss groups. Um, and we're going to get to this and how this relates to some of the, the answers that she might be looking for. And so it's actually how I started working in the prison system. Mm. Um, she asked if I would be interested in kind of joining in as like one of the group facilitators as like one of the team. And so I was like, sure. And, then they were like, hey, we have these juvenile programs. Would you want to go into the jails and provide grief and loss counseling? Because almost every kid in jail had significant losses in their life. And so we would go into the jails and do this. And that's how I started actually working in the jails. Um, but, um, you know, you will see people struggle with these things indeterminately sometimes. You know, it'll just it can be for the rest of their life where they're still struggling to grasp it. But most adults are able to kind of move through the emotions and the spaces and the phases and eventually get to a spot where they can get to acceptance. Yeah. It's, um, it's so hard because especially when you're talking about like suicide, right? I feel like the, um, the bargaining aspect probably comes up a lot more there, right? Because you're like, what could I have done? Like if I had done this, then maybe the X wouldn't have happened, right? Like you can, you can start to, I would imagine, replay a lot of those types of scenarios. Mm -hmm. Like if I said this differently or if, if I was here that night or, or whatever. Um, and that just puts a lot of heaviness on that individual, right? That's already, mm -hmm. there's already a hard process and now you're, you're adding a whole nother layer, but that's like, you know, a way of trying to cope. The denial part, I, I was going to ask, like, what is the phase where you're just trying to, like, busy yourself and, like, not really deal with it? But that's technically denial. It could right? be denial. Yeah. Because I feel like that happens a lot, right? Like you said, like, somebody's cleaning the house and doing all the stuff and they're all put together and it's like, how is this person functioning? And it's like, one, yes. Complete some, avoidance. Yeah, just mm -hmm. avoiding, right? And, like, that person might be, like, crying themselves asleep. You just don't see it, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes, like, you know, there does need to be a strong person, right, to to navigate whether it's like the household or, or whatever it might be. So, um, I totally understand why someone would, would do that and, and kind of put on that like front, but maybe, you know, still make sure that even if you maybe have to do that, that you're still also giving yourself time to process, even if it is alone when nobody else is watching, mm -hmm. like you have to, to do that. Um, because avoiding it is certainly not, not going to solve any of this. Something that has, has always helped me with, you know, I mean, maybe this is kind of 
cliche or, or super out there or cheesy, I don't, you know, whatever you want to call it. But if you are either religious or spiritual or, or connected in any sense that way, you can, you know, really just whether it's pray or, or meditate or just kind of ask like, Hey, you know, like, like give, you know, give me a sign that like you're here. Or, or sometimes we, we will give ourselves signs with people, right? Like when I see this, it always reminds me of that person. And, and maybe that's not like the initial stages of, mm-hmm. of grief, right? Like that's kind of like later on. Um, but sometimes that can be like a nice thing to be like, you know, you see later on, like, all right, they're still kind of like in my life. They're still here, but you can even just like, again, pray, meditate, do whatever. And that you feel comfortable with and just kind of, you know, let them know how you feel and be like, if, you know, if you need to say anything to me, like, again, I know this sounds really kind of out there, but just more so like trying to have a conversation with that person. Mm -hmm. Right. And even if someone is no longer here, you can still technically have a conversation with Mm -hmm. them. And again, in whatever way that you feel, kind of works in that sense and sometimes that's just comforting in its own way Mm -hmm. and it can also just provide some some clarity on how to move forward Mm -hmm. you know um not always right especially like right in those early stages i think it's you know just going to be like sad you're going to be upset you're going to be going through oscillating between those those three Mm -hmm. phases um but i would say that that's something that you you could do when you feel ready and i feel like that's a way to still stay connected to that person um and again whatever you believe in there is usually a way that you can connect that to like that person is still a part of your life Mm -hmm. and their soul like is still here yeah um that would be i would say one of the best ways to you know once you've grieved to then you know move forward and feel like they're still kind of a part of your your life and then just also like you know i know again maybe this sounds cliche but maybe that's why it's a cliche right like just kind of honoring their their memory right Mm -hmm. like thing like honoring the things that like you loved about them right like let's say you're like wow like my friend had like the best sense of humor like they always saw like you know the best in people they always like found humor out of something like and maybe that's not naturally like your own predisposition right but like maybe you love that about them so you're like maybe i'm gonna like try to incorporate that like Mm -hmm. as a way to like honor them and try to like see things in a way that like they would have and you know i think that that's another way that we can kind of try to incorporate those aspects of them that like we love into our lives Mm -hmm. and because there's there has to be something at least one thing if not many things that you like loved about this person that maybe you don't necessarily currently have or or Mm -hmm. operate that way and you can use that i don't don't know where that probably falls again like kind of later down the stage of of grieving like once you've gotten past that yeah i some of the like I think the person was it the rituals. They yeah, were? they were saying, um, like, are there any rituals or ceremonies beyond the traditional okay. wake and funeral that have helped you deal with with so, this? Yeah, so that's um, kind of sounding more immediate. I'm talking right probably later. So, for some of the things that that help is uh, when people die or we lose them from our lives, we like we internalize everything. And what I mean by that too, is we also withdraw from like the outside. We tend to not talk about it. We tend to feel everything that we're feeling inside and we don't actually do things. I'm not saying we don't, but when we do activities that help process through what we're feeling, that's when you can take a grieving process that could be forever and you could shorten it. You know, like you're always going to miss that person. Mm -hmm. There's never going to be a part of you that, it's like just yeah I'm, I'm totally great that you know mike is dead like no but what you can do is you can help yourself not be as controlled or emotionally powerless to some of this so some of the things that have helped um is i highly recommend if you can perhaps even finding like a support group for something like this like you know when we used to do the grief groups we had like, there was like this whole separate house that was built so people could come and like there was a playroom for kids. Um, and you know, the parents would sit in a circle and there was like a group facilitator who would just kind of guide the process. And some of the different activities that we would do would be like, we used to have one of them was called the grief trail mix. Um, and grief trail mix was, we had like these different items on a table that were all like food. Like one was M&Ms. Okay. And M&Ms represented sweet memories. And then there was one where it was, uh, one was pretzels and pretzels were like, um, how do you feel connected to this person? Right. Marshmallows represented like something that was soft or sweet about the individual. 
And so and you, you can do this with anything. Like you could put a bag of potato chips and be like, what was, you know, difficult about the process? What was, what were some <laughs> of the conflict, right? And what you would do is sometimes you could do those things and, you know, maybe you don't want to go to a, a church and do that or something, but like maybe you can call your friends and be like, hey, I, you know, I just want to do this thing where we talk about, you know, Elizabeth and we're going to all sit around and share stories about them and sweet memories and fond memories and like tell tales about that person and what they meant to us and cry and grieve and feel love and support from the people around you. I think for this particular person, one of the things that I would tell her is to reach out to her close family, her close friends and to take cover and support within them. They want to be there for you. Like, I don't know anybody who has close friends who, when somebody, when something tragic happens to them, that their close friends don't want to be there for them, right? You have a number of really good close people. And so like, if you lost somebody, their hearts are going to be broken for you. They might not know the person that you lost, but they're like, oh my God, I can see the loss in Lauren. I see how much she cared about this person, whatever. They want to love you. Let them, let them do that. Let them be a part of that process. And I think so often as adults, the message to us becomes we have to become independent. We have to do things on our own. And so, you know, like, I mean, that's like the job of a parent, right? You take a child and the objective is to make this kid become independent. And so we get to this point where we don't want to ask for help anymore. We don't, we, we feel like it's weak or, we're, or, or it's wrong in some way for us to reach out for support. And it's like... So let me get this straight. You're willing to be there for me whenever I need you. But the second I need somebody, I don't even ask for help, right? It's like, no, like let's kind of break that barrier and let's reach out to somebody and say, hey, I'm, today's a really bad day and I just, I need to talk. Like your friends will want to be there for you. Mm -hmm. So let the people around you love you. Um, let them be a part of that process. Let them be a shoulder for you to cry on or somebody who can drive you someplace. Um, some of the other rituals that have occurred are, you know, poems or letter writing. Um, I encourage you to write a letter to the person, let them know like everything that was in your heart. Um, and I encourage this not, this does not have to be something that was just done in one setting. Like you might just sit down and start writing, mm -hmm. hit save, come back to it. If you're doing this on a computer, maybe it's in your journal, um, hit save, Come back, read what you wrote, write some more, and keep writing. Mm -hmm. Write and write and write and write and write until you're like, there's nothing else I can say. And then when you've done that, read it. Read it over and over a few times. And when it's done, sometimes going to a special place that reminds you of that person, whether it's like the beach or the forest or a park or a spot in your house or something like that, you know, and read the letter. You know, maybe it's going to their grave. You know, if they have a grave. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, one thing that can help is for some people engaging in dialogue with the lost one. And I don't mean this in like a way that makes you feel psychotic. Yeah. That's, yeah. But continuing <laughs> to talk to them, <laughs> yeah. you know, because a lot of times you can visualize what that person might say to you in a mm -hmm. moment like this. And, you know, I think any, I mean, I don't, I don't want to speak for anybody else, but I know if, if I, if I died, you know, do I want people to, you know, I don't want them necessarily to be sad and, you know, or to ruin or forego aspects of their life. Like, so I would want that person to be like, no, I don't want you not to take that chance. I don't want you to not move on. I don't want you to, to whatever it is, like, go and do that. Like, go be you, go be happy. Like I loved that person and they loved me. So I want them to continue on that life, especially mm -hmm. When you're gone, you don't, you know, there's, there's that part of you that it's like, and this is where the soul and the spirit come into play, mm -hmm. right? Like if I'm not here physically, it doesn't mean that I'm dead. There's an old saying that a person dies twice in their life. They die once when they physically die and they die a second time when the last person says their name. Mm -hmm. So if you're willing to keep their name alive and you're willing to keep their memories alive and you're willing to converse with them, like... My grandmother and grandfather died years ago. My dad died years ago. There's times I still talk to them. Like, I'm just like, oh, you know, I really wish I had an opportunity or, you know, whatever it is. I don't want to, I can disclose my own personal thoughts that I speak <laughs> to my dead grandma about, but, um, 
you know, those conversations remind you that the person, no matter whether they're here or not, is still a part of you. Mm -hmm. And that as long as they're a part of you, they have a life. Yeah. And that's what I was saying with trying to connect, whether it's again, through meditation, through prayer, through just writing, you Mm -hmm. know, and just trying to, again, not in a way that you feel like psychotic, like talking to someone, but yeah, like keeping them alive and, and, and yeah, even again, if you believe in this kind of stuff, like asking for signs of something, right? Like that's a big thing that helps. I know some people feel connected and again, it's not to be like, Hey, show me a black pen. And then you're like, Oh my gosh, this is them. They're here. Like, no, of course it's not like that. And, and I think anybody who, who subscribes to thinking like that, they, they understand what I'm saying, but I, I feel like that can be very comforting. And you can also just, again, keep, like you said, ask for that. But then also when you're doing that, you also know like, okay, Hey, like I'm doing this, but they would want me like, you're kind of putting it in their perspective. Like what would they probably really want me to do? And then you probably already know that answer, you know? And like, they wouldn't want me to be sad. They wouldn't want me to be doing this. They would want me to be going for whatever, Mm -hmm. making this decision. And, um, so I think that's like so important. And, and then, you know, after that grieving stage, well, I guess how, how do I say this? How long? There's never going to be a timeline, right? Mm-hmm. Because grief, like you said, it could be a few weeks, could be months, could be years, could be, could be never, right? Um, just because you, you know, I can imagine, you know, someone who's been with a spouse for so long and then they die. Like, I can't even imagine that the pain of that, you know, like do, do certain people ever really recover from that? Like, I don't know. Um, but like at what point, I guess, is it like, okay, hey, maybe like say you've, say you've been in that d- depression type state, right? And this is no longer now like a part of like the grieving process. This is now like, this is my everyday state, right? Like when, I guess, is a good time to have some intervention with this? Like when, you know, from like, a, again, a clinical perspective, when is this no longer like, hey, we're really grieving this versus like, this is now in, in, in every aspect of my life and I can no longer like function. Is that making sense? I, I'm not yeah, sure how to I mean, phrase that. You know, like is the person starting to re-engage with life, mm-hmm. right? Like now, for example, if you lose somebody significant to you, your work, usually if you work in like a, a corporate environment, like a larger company, you, they might give you like a week, mm-hmm. right? And then the expectation is that like within that week, you're going to have the funeral, the wake, and you're going to come back to work, you're going to be sad when you come back to work. Yeah. Right. But are you coming back? Mm -hmm. Um, Are you taking care of the kids? Are you still making their lunches? Mm -hmm. Like, are you still taking a shower? You know, you might not be in the gym hitting PRs, but like, can you still, you know, it's common for people to be like, I don't want to work out. Like, I don't feel good. I just, I don't, I'm sad. You know what I mean? And that's fine. Those things are fine. But are you slowly starting to re-engage with life? And if you're pulling away from everything, like then we can really see a little bit more of that impact. Mm -hmm. And again, sometimes it's not super clear because it's like, there's going to be people who are going to go through the motions, but they're still going through life. And that's Mm -hmm. normal because they're grieving versus it's like been three or four weeks. You're not back to work. Now you're in danger of losing your job. Right. Like Mm -hmm. you're not making lunches for the kids anymore. You're not taking them to after school programs. You're not playing with them. You're not now again, like when you're sad or angry, like, you know, sitting down and playing Play-Doh with your kids might not be the most engaging thing for you to be Mm -hmm. doing, but you know, and you might feel kind of mindless and like zoned out, but there's ways that you start to see people starting to reincorporate, you know, and get back into life. And if they're not doing those things and they're just pulling away from everything, then maybe a little bit more of an intervention is needed. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, at that point in time, at least. Yeah. I don't know. I was just thinking and about, it's it's a feel, right? You've got to get in and like really kind of see it, know who that person was. And usually it's the people around them that are closest to to bring it to their attention. Yeah. If you know, that was kind of more so what I was asking. Cause obviously the person in it isn't maybe going to recognize right. it at first. So it's like, okay, so if someone's listening in there, they're noticing maybe a friend doing those kinds of things, right? Again, there's going to be this layer of sadness. There's going to be this layer of just kind of melancholy over things, right? Maybe a little bit more disinterested, maybe saying, Hey, yeah, I don't want to go hang out or, or this, but those day-to-day things that are, are keeping them, you know, at like baseline, right? Mm-hmm. Are, are they doing those things? And if you have a friend maybe who is struggling with that, that's kind of when it's maybe time to have that conversation. Like, Hey, just getting a little, 
you know, concerned here. And I think a lot of that could probably be circumvented if the person who is struggling does reach out to their friends, right? right? And just like lets them know. Because if, you know, if I didn't, if I didn't tell someone, then they'd be like, wow, like Lauren's acting really differently. Mm -hmm. This is really weird. She's ignored all my texts and, you know, I haven't talked to her or what, like that could be very strange. Um, So that's, I think where it's helpful if someone is like, you know, leaning on friends and um, able to, to just like engage with whatever community, you know, and Mm -hmm. maybe even, I don't know, again, with this situation, like this was a close friend, like, did you guys have like a friend group that was like a mutual friend? Like there could be, you know, mutual friends who are are dealing with this too. That could be, Mm -hmm. of course, helpful because they would know that person. Um, But yeah, like once you're past this grieving, like really just try to integrate and remember all of those great things about that person. And like, how can I really just like honor them and remember them and and have them a part of my kind of day-to-day life? And Mm -hmm. I think that that's the best way that we can move forward with that um as as like hard as it is but you want to keep those memories alive um and in a way that is that is like healthy for you right mm-hmm. like of, like you could say um you know like say you know you had a family member die right um like a parent and like you go to their old house every time you go to their old house like while you're getting things cleaned up like you're remembering them but it's like not in a good way like you're just like mm-hmm. sad Okay, like that's maybe remembering them like in like remembering them and honoring them in like positive like healthy outlets Mm -hmm. right not in a way that's just like just going to bring you down Mm -hmm. every single time that you do that yeah and this might be a hard thing for some people to hear but it's important like if you've lost somebody who like lives with you for example Mm -hmm. it's very common people don't like want to change anything in the house they're like oh you know this was his clothes or this was her stuff Mm -hmm. whatever and to a certain degree, like boxing those things up, removing them from your sight, from your visual field, Mm -hmm. it's important, Mm -hmm. right? I'm not saying remove every, you know, like don't sanitize the house to such a degree that the person doesn't even like look like that they were a part of your life. You know, keep a picture or two or something. But like if you're walking into your closet and you're seeing clothes, we need to take those clothes down, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe even going through them and keeping one or two things that really remind you of that person. Like if they had like a big baggy sweatshirt or like a collared shirt or a tie that you bought them that they used to wear, whatever it is or something, right? You can keep a hand, some of those things, you know, give a few to other people if you want, but like moving on in life is necessary. Like your life didn't end. It doesn't, it feels like it did. It feels like you might want to die, you know, like that there's nothing else for you to hold on to. But sometimes all the things in the house, you know, or the things in your life can really be triggering. And it can keep us in this space. And like I said, you're never going to get to a spot where you're happy that this person is gone, but you can get to a spot where you can experience joy and fulfillment in your life again. It just might take time. It's just going to be hard. And it's okay that it's hard. It's okay that you're crying. And I think if you did end a relationship in bad terms, if this was like, you know, I said some things or I did some things that were that, that I don't like about myself, that I wish I could redo. Like a lot of us have had that experience in our lives. And so the, the best thing I can tell you to do, and this is when we, I think we did a podcast on forgiveness. When you go back and you look at the relationship and if you have serious regret about something that you did, the best thing that you can do is to remind yourself like, okay, whether the person actively left your life or in this case, whether they're actually gone now from a, from a death perspective is to say like your life meant something to me. And so even though this didn't work out the way I wanted it to, I'm going to make changes to make sure that this, whatever dynamic in the relationship doesn't occur again, whether that's like going to therapy or whether that's changing aspects of myself or my personality or changing different ways that I approach problems, like whatever it was that was the issue within the relationship, you create a dynamic where you're like, okay, the best way that I can show this person that they loved me is by making sure that I never do this again, by changing this so that I don't repeat that pattern. And that goes for anybody that you've ever hurt. And again, we don't know whether this was like, she's hurting from a perspective or he is hurting from a perspective that the relationship ended poorly or because they were just really loved them and, and mattered to them. Yeah. I think that was a perfect way to end that. And like you said, any relationship you, you can do that, but especially if it was maybe, not not the best towards the end so we really really appreciate this question and that's why we do have that anonymous um google form because i do 
understand that certain questions are really hard to ask and maybe people want to have um, remain anonymous in that process. So um, thank you again for sharing this. We send you all the best. And for anybody listening who's dealing with, with death and loss right now, because it's it's a process that we are all all having to navigate at different periods of time and sometimes when we you know least expect it. So um, if you guys are interested in, in submitting a question that we could answer together on the show, that will be in the show notes. Uh, for anybody who's interested in counseling with you, Rick, how can they reach you? Full circle therapy, FL at gmail.com. And for all other inquiries about coaching, consulting, or mentorship, you can visit teamlocofit.com. So thank you guys so much for tuning in and we will talk to you next time.